Okay, if we want to just sort of wrap up our good discussion, uh, we'll have a question and answer time or an interaction time. I'm sure that the big E word has created much provocative conversation. Uh, most of the time you don't hear a pastor begin to address economics and uh, I just touched on what I call some early theological on-ramps to economic flourishing, to macroeconomics. Um, and economics brings with it all kinds of ideas of what it is. Uh, classical definition, Thomas Sowell, is the allocation of scarce resources, right? With, with alternate uses, there's all kinds of different definitions and economics is a very complex discipline. But biblically, uh, the idea of cultivating blessing from the created order and fruitfulness and, in a collaborative community is really the core of economics, of sharing value with others. So let's have some interaction. Uh, I wanted to move from me to we just a little bit. Uh, we often talk about work in terms of me, but there's a we component, and that's the bridge to economic flourishing in life as we share resources with each other and allocate and add value, okay? So thoughts, questions? Ideas? Yeah. So, Tom. Jeff, uh, Jeff uh, right? Yeah, Jeff. Jeff good yeah. to see you again. Good to see you. Yeah. Uh, Tom, talk about the, uh, the role of the Christian uh, in affecting the actual system. So, you, you know, we're, we're talking about faith informing work and faith informing economics, and there's a system that's involved with that. And how, how does the Christian affect the system? It's a great question, Jeff. Um, I think, again, I'm pretty profoundly shaped in my understanding of cultural change by James Davison Hunter at University of Virginia. I, I worked with him for a while, learned something from him. And again, he talks a lot about the change, ultimate change is not the individual actor, not the great idea, but overlapping networks. So we just, in terms of cultural change and theories and framework, I'm kind of a fan of James Davison Hunter. So there are other ways of seeing it, you know, great ideas, great people, but are bottom up, top down. So I'm just saying conceptually, um, how we approach cultural engagement, I'm, I think James Davison Hunter has done the best at helping the church navigate a faithful presence, not withdrawal, but a faithful presence within culture. So that's the broader system. We talk about economics or any other broader system. I think, again, the most important thing is to be a part of a vibrant local church community that collectively is living this life out together in a community. So I'm just saying, but within that, we are all salt and light. We are scattered in different pockets of power and influence. And we, we steward power. Uh, Amy Sherman, I think you've had Amy speak. Amy's a dear friend. But she has just brought together the importance of vocational stewardship, that all of life is stewardship, so that we steward that. So I'm just saying, what I would, what I would say is we all have different stewardships within the system to first of all discern it, right? And have some sense of understanding because all systems have a combination of mix of the good, bad, and ugly. Sin is systemic in whatever form of racism, injustice, it's also individual. So, but I think as individuals, have a hopeful realism, not a utopian idealism. I mean, the, the, the economic system is, math, let's say economics, massive system, lots of players, lots of power. But I think you can, in a local church community, in that context, you can begin to make a difference for the flourishing of the most vulnerable, and you can help equip people to live their pockets of greatness. I'll use um, Jim Collins' language, right? Wherever you are, whether you're the CEO or you're washing dishes, uh, you can create a pocket of greatness in that workspace. And I, so I would say, wherever you are, create a pocket of greatness, not for your goodness, but but live that virtuous, Christ-like life of diligent work, serving your neighbor, loving, doing good work well done, and that will begin to have an influence, at least in that pocket. But if you have more vocational power and influence, then you are held before God at a higher account. So Paul says in a, in a word of, right, master-slave language, we don't like that one, but I mean, in the economy of the first century, in the Roman economy, you know, if you have the power of being the employer, using that language, you better treat your, your employees right and give them a liberal wage and so forth. So it's a great question. I think um, I would just say that there's a limited amount of change that an individual can bring unless they have an amazing influence. But all of us can have an influence in our pocket of greatness, in our families, if we're married or single, in our communities, and in our workplace. Um, and I would just suggest that if we follow Christ, there is both. There's both the fragrance of death and the fragrance of life. Some people are going to push back against us because of what we believe and who we love. But there's also an incredible, if we're formed in Christ, incredible value add to a culture of an organization, right? Because God designed us to flourish. So if Christians are living into that design, 
That design in the long term is going to bring flourishing. And this is the Proverbs picture when the righteous uh, flourish, the city rejoices. And Tim Keller and Amy Sherman have done a lot with that. But I mean, that a flourishing life lived into God's design with love and humility has a profound influence in the environment over time. But one person can make a difference. But the ultimate is salt and light is a collective in a local church community. So I'm pretty, pretty big on the local church. You might imagine that as a pastor, but I think that's true in every dimension of sociology and ecclesiology. Great, great point, Jeff. But, yeah. Comment. Yeah. I saw something on the internet that is redemptive. It speaks to what you're just talking about. It was a, a local governor who was concerned about all the street people and wanted yeah. to do something about it. And he actually gathered them up and gave them jobs. And what they were doing was like gardening. And um, the program continued. I guess it's been very successful. Yep. And these same people have continued to garden. And what he found is that, contrary to what you might think, they weren't, most people were not drug addicts or just, you know, struggling that way. They just need an opportunity. They exactly. just need a break. And exactly. I just was so encouraged that there is something that we can do. Yeah, that's a great point. Is it Karen? Yeah, yeah wonderful. And again, as local churches, and again, I'm, I'm assuming most of us are involved some way local churches. I hope you are if you're a follower of Jesus. Because right? you're called to Jesus, you're called to a community, both. There's an amazing amount that can be done over time in a city or a community when collectively the local church is a local church in the world. So I love it when I hear a governor or someone, but also the local church can really collaborate for the common good. We host conference, an example, with educators, broad, broad educators, business leaders in our city, and we host it in a, a real ecumenical heart. I mean, you know, we're, they know what we believe, and we're solid Christians. We're committed to our views of truth and knowledge, but we work together for the common good and job creation. We have in Kansas City one of the finest um, uh, foundations of entrepreneurship in the world, Kauffman Foundation, multi-billion dollar foundation, the Kauffman Foundation. And we have the people in our congregation have helped create the Million Cups program, which is an entrepreneurship program, a billion entrepreneurship across our country, particularly in younger ages of millennials, of helping them start new businesses. So I mean, there's, that's not our program, but our church is deeply connected to that common good initiative that creates jobs and opportunity. So I just, across our city. I mean, that's the thing I wouldn't have imagined, I'm just saying transparently, 25 years ago, that, that being deeply committed to the gospel, committed to the local church, committed to the cultural mandate, the Great Commandment, and the Great Commission, that that would be a deeply embedded part of our mission as a church, as we're the scattered church. I would have never imagined that 25 years ago, and now I see how important that is. Yeah. So, I love hearing those stories. It matters. Yeah. I hear people increasingly talking about an economic Armageddon, and that uh, I can't conceive of what the number trillion is, <laughs> and how many trillions we are in debt in yep. the United States of America. Uh, and I'm wondering if our modern politicians and, our, and so on are somewhat the robbers on the road to Jericho, and that the victim is our children and our grandchildren, and what kind of yep. stable society and economy are we leaving for succeeding generations? Yep. Well, I would just say, I think it's a good point. I'm not going to make a political statement or an economic. I'm not an economist. I have friends that are good economists. They're teaching me and guiding me. So that's not my area of expertise. But I would say that the people I know that are in the know, um, you know, have a sense that we are in trouble. Um, and you don't have to be an economist to know. And I don't, I'm not saying Chicken Little or Armageddon. I don't know. I don't want to have any response to it. But to have, for example, negative interest rates, the plane is flying upside down. Something's going on, right? I mean. What that means, we don't know. And, uh, but I would just say that as followers of Jesus, as the local church, we are called to be faithfully present in any cultural context. So it might be a season. Uh, who knows what God has that the, the church in America, the true church in America, is going to enter a season of suffering and difficulty along. But then, just like whether it's the black pl plague or a black swan or whatever, this is an opportunity not for fear. It's an opportunity for great hope and giving our life away for others. Because we are called for sacrifice. So, <laughs> I'm careful what I say there, but I, I have my own concerns as an individual and what I know. I mean, I do, but, but I'm just saying this is God is sovereign, I believe, over politics and all the stuff that's going on. Um, but when we do not follow God's design, okay, whether it's human relationships or economics over a long time, usually we suffer the consequences. And again, it's not just one, it's all of us. And often the most vulnerable suffer most. 
So again, it's an opportunity for the church to be the church. So I don't disagree with your assessment, but I'm not, I mean, I believe in hopeful realism. I'm very hopeful because Jesus is in charge and he knows what's going on and he's calling the church to be faithful in times of good and difficulty and give our life away for others for God's glory. And that might mean suffering and persecution and sacrifice and giving up our meal for somebody else, right? I don't mean that glibly. I mean, I've enjoyed a more prosperous, privileged place, but it's also kind of a dangerous place sometimes for our faith. Yep. Yep. So a question, observation, then a question. Yeah. Uh, it seems like, okay, there's a growing group of churches and people starting to say, all right, um, we maybe have been asking some of the wrong questions and we need to yeah. be thinking new thoughts. And um, I think, you know, some that would say, all right, we need to simplify this thing and, you know, we need to go back. And then even inside of the simplify movement, you can then all of a sudden within the last couple of years, you get six different competing organizing principles yeah. around yeah. which to yeah. organize Something I thought, well, only we could make the simplify message very complex. Very complex. You know, so, it's a paradox of simplicity. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm with you. I'm um, with you. You know, and then I think an observation. I, I so I'm a lead pastor, but yeah. I think you know we sometimes I think I see this in our organizations. I see this. You know, we get organizational ADD. Yep. You know, we're it's well like, said. Over here, we're over there. Flavor of the month. So for you guys, as you went on this journey for the long haul, yep, the long what were haul. some what were some things you did? To say, okay, this is not a program. Yep. This is a paradigm. Yep. You know, adjustment. Have, you know, and how do you keep that at the forefront of your mind over the long haul? Yeah. Um, that says because this is not a fad, this is foundational. I wouldn't yes, be here in, yes, you're in the scriptures. Yes, but the fact yep. is, we were a people of the book before and have you know, somehow missed some things that some are some things. Some fairly obvious. At least I did. Yeah, so I think a lot of us are there. So how did you guys keep it in the forefront yeah. over a sustained change effort? Yeah, and again, let me just make an unashamed plug for Made to Flourish. If you're a part of that, we're going to try to build it out to help pastors around the country be more spiritually whole and more effective. So, I mean, we, let me answer. Part of the goal of why I'm involved with a new organization, not that we need another one, right, is to help pastors and leaders live into this for the long haul and learn from one another as humble servants. So I just say a couple things, but I'm saying made to flourish is a response that say we have a vehicle now, especially for clergy and Christian leaders to join in and be a part and learn from one another and help us do this better. I would say three or four things real quickly. One, it does have to be embedded in theological conviction. So whether it's around whatever structure you have, your staff or elders or, or deacons, that you work together around the scripture and wrestle with what the scripture teaches and without any uncharitable sense of where we've been, say we can, it's, I always say, it's not like we were all that bad, it's that we can do this more integrally, we can do this a little better, and for glor glorify God and be more effective in our mission, right, and, and disciple people. So I'm not saying, again, hear me, that everything in the past was bad. It's just saying, there's, it's like the remodeled kitchen, there's a little bit better way to do this, I think. Humbly, let's do this together and let's figure it out. So it has to come from biblical teaching, where people hear the word of God and say, wow, so what are the implications? What is my responsibility? And then I, th I would say just with your leadership, staff or deacon or whatever, that you're working through this. And there are resources like Tim's or other books that you just kind of work through so you have the theology. And then I would say is that you want to preach it and teach it. You want to begin some praxis to help learn. You want to be more curious as a pastor, learn from your congregant leaders in business and medicine or whatever they're in or, or butcher, baker, or candlestick maker. So... Um, but I think it starts with a long view, starts with a humble view, um, and it starts with a biblical view and say, I think when I look at scripture, look at the moment we're in, there's some adjustments we need to make a little bit, mid-course corrections, but you gotta have your leadership team with you in conviction, I'll, I'll just say that. And then we could talk, and that's part of Made to Flourish, and the website, and these were, it's liturgies, ideas of creatively reinforcing this on Sunday, or whenever you meet, as well as discipleship curriculum from children to older, older folks. So, um, I don't want to get too long in that, but you're exactly right where you are. This is not a fad. This is deeply embedded in the Reformation. Uh, it, we've we've de-emphasized some things that need a little more emphasis. That's what I would say. So there's things that we can do together to humbly be more faithful and fruitful as pastors. Everything from a workplace visit, that's a simple thing, but it's profound how it changes people. Like, I mean, th imagine Reed, drinking the Kool-Aid, I call it, but I mean, a younger pastor who thinks like that. And he preaches brilliantly. He exegetes scripture brilliantly. He visits hospitals, right? But he has a whole other mindset that is profoundly shaping his understanding of mission. 
And that's what we give you an example. So. But be a part of Made with First if that works for you. I'm not, I'm not, I hope I'm not pushing it the wrong way, but it's like that's what we're trying to do together. How do we do this better together for the glory of God and the beauty of his church? Yep. Yep. As we were talking at our table after, uh, after your last... Uh, your last point. It was yeah. it was just interesting to. I was reminded of that. There's that quote from Emperor Julian. It was like the fourth century, and he was talking about the early church, and he said it's disgraceful when no Jew is a beggar, and then all these impious Galileans they feed and clothe our poor in addition to their own. And I just I thought just what a what a cool vision. I was reminded of that. What a cool vision of what the what the church can do um, as we think about how. What's the responsibility of the church to, con to you know, to um, interact with these social issues versus Excellent. the the government? So, Excellent comment. Excellent comment. I mean, again, this this is not new. It's just understanding the present moment we're in and perhaps some of the blindnesses that we have that we want to be a little more clear in it. Yeah, brilliantly said. Yep. You, <clears throat> excuse me. You mentioned joining compassion and capacity. capacity. So I'm just curious. You as a lead pastor, very busy, yeah. how do you know the right balance of what capacity you have to give when you see needs come? And um, just how do you personally work through, you know, is my heart losing compassion yeah. versus I, I really don't have capacity and I'll find someone else or I, I have no time and attention to give that so I need to just let it go? Great question. And I don't have the answers to that. I'm, I'm, I tend to be, uh, I have the sin of trying to do too much. I mean, you know, we all have sins, and pastors can be slothful. We also can be workaholics. So, I mean, just transparently, we can go too far. But I, what I would say is, how is capacity expanded? It's expanded through multiplication and generativity. So I'm constantly thinking about not only where can I leverage the little gifts I have, but how can I help empower and encourage others, and how do I expand their capacity? That's true in terms of, now think about this. I mean, maybe that's not the way I should say it. But I really believe when I study scripture and the empowerment of the spirit that we were never designed to live merely in the limitations of our human finitude. I really believe that there's a, a supernatural empowerment. It doesn't mean we do all work and don't rest, but there's an incredible synergy beyond human capacity that multiplies our energies and strength. It's like manna, right? So I do think there's a sense of limited capacity and there's also supernatural capacity given. It's like the loaves and fishes. So I find sometimes in my life, just personally, where, and Tyler could say that the last few um, months, it's, it's not good. I'm, I'm all for a quiet life of heart, right? I'm not, it's not about more, more, more. But in our season right now, what we're doing, there have been times, and my wife said, I've just said, Lord, tell me. I couldn't do this on my own. I know I can't. I wouldn't have the strength. So, but there are times for rest as well. So I'm saying capacity of time and energy, and, but I'm saying specifically the capacity of how do, you, how do you nourish wealth creation in your gift mix? So we're doing a lot of entrepreneurship thinking. How do you help, again, not for worshiping wealth, but for creating capacity for the world? Um, so we're trying to think of entrepreneurship and other ways of multiplying capacity in all dimensions of life. So it is a challenge, and the danger is to try to do too much, but I would say, the challenge before God is to be generative, empower others, um, and there are times I've just found whether it's in giving of money, prayer, uh, time, whatever the calling you have is that God empowers you in ways that you look back and go, you know, I didn't have enough to do that, and the Lord held me in his hand and gave me power. So, I mean, there are, I'm just saying, I don't want to think that capacity, we have different levels, but I do think there's a supernatural synergy of divine capacity when we find ourselves in that place of dependence. And I've seen moments where I, I didn't do that, <laughs> right? So God gives you that strength, but suffering, difficulty, beyond that. So, but capacity is an important concept. That's what I'm trying to say, that we, we talk about compassion, but there's a few things more frustrating to have compassion and not have capacity to do anything about it. Uh, and that's what I was trying to say. Or you have capacity and you're ruthless. You don't have compassion. You're selfish. So. But I'm wrestling with that. And I'm trying to figure that out in my life right now, personally, just in my world. But I'm much more committed as a pastor to help people think about economic capacity and not just uh, immediate poverty alleviation. I care for both. 
but I want to think long term to help them build capacity for their dignity and their own economic well-being so they can have the gift of sharing. Remember, Jesus says it's more blessed to give than receive, and people say, I never had the opportunity to give. And we can give in, in love and forgiveness, that's important, but the joy of giving economic capacity to others is an incredible joy, and Jesus says more blessed to give than receive, and that's in an economic context in Acts 20. Right? So I want to help other people have more capacity, not for self-absorption, not for consumption, but for giving it away to others, the joy of giving. So I'm much more concerned about building capacity, much more concerned about that than I ever was before, and the importance of economics for people's well-being, whether it's a family or the globe. That's what I was just trying to touch on in that talk. Yep. Yeah. Hi. I think we're getting where we need to wrap up pretty quick. Last question? Tessa, okay. Good. Great, great thoughts. Um, I loved that you uh, told the Good Samaritan story and, and kind of underscored, at least touched a chord with me about, you know, kind of setting the stage of like, this person is, you know, not Jewish uh, uh, racially or yeah. religiously. Yeah. And that kind of struck a chord of something that I had been thinking about for a year in terms of um, how does, in, to bridge the Sunday to Monday topic that we've touched on, um, how, how can we confront issues of race and class in, in the economic flourishing on the pulpits on Sunday um, in terms of the our own local church communities, especially here in the Twin Cities? Yeah, great question. I think it's important. I, you know, I'm, I'm a deeply committed to exposition, to take the text and bring it out. So I think, I don't know if you have a teaching role, but I'm saying I think you take it from the text. I call it the on-ramps on to economic life, whether it's injustice, whether it's lack of jobs, racism. But I think you have the stewardship, I have the stewardship to communicate that we are called to do justice and to live the gospel out in all dimensions of life. So what I would encourage is just the balance of affirming those who are wealth creators, affirming business in a good way, understanding that business, like anything else, is broken. It has all kinds of issues, right? But the danger sometimes for pastors People who hear it that are in commerce, they communicate the negative side of business. So do a balance. Like, I mean, affirm the goodness of wealth creation and the hard job of starting business. I mean, that's what I would say. But also, there's a whole group, and when Steve Garber comes, he'll be unpacking the, the economics of mutuality. We touched a little bit about this, on this book we're working on. But to see business and economics as a triple bottom line, the economics of mutuality, that it's about people on the planet and profits. So I'm just saying, just have an approach as a pastor, get, gain more understanding of economics, gain, maybe you have that understanding of the business world, commerce, so that you have an understanding, and yes, you address areas where business and economics fall short, systemically and individual, that's important. But you also affirm many people who are doing their best in an economic contest, context, in a difficult business context. I'm just saying, as pastors, I get that from people who are in the commerce world, and they say, my pastor has no idea the difficulty in my world. So they hear, this is all the bad stuff we do, but I don't hear enough about the good things we are trying to do. So I just, that's what I'd say. But yes, yeah, speak on it. But speak on it from the text, and be gospel-centered, and be curious, and learn people's worlds, whether it's in medicine, or teaching, or business, whatever the vocations, or a welder, learn their world so that you can understand how to communicate with them without condescension, and understand that all of it's broken, but we are not to leave it broken, we're to try to bring redemption to it. So I'd encourage you to speak on it, do it with balance, do it biblically, so you have balance from the scriptures, Create, go from scriptures to the world, uh, that always has grace and truth to it, right? There's love, gentleness, but truth. So I think yes, by all means, the gospel is to speak into every nook and cranny of life, man. I mean, that's your stewardship as a pastor. It's not just me and Jesus. It, it profoundly shapes how I treat my neighbor in the world, how I live in it. So. Lord bless you in your teaching and your work. Yep. Yep. Okay, I think we're done. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Pastor. Thank you. I just want to thank Tom and Tyler for being here today with us. This was a fantastic presentation. Um, thank you for everything you shared with us today. I have a few housekeeping items, and I'm wondering if I can get my slide up here on the screen. Um, we're going to transition to lunch soon, so I have a few things to tell you. If you've got a yellow ticket, that means that you are going to the Monson Dining Center, and that is actually one level above us, so you can take the stairs or the elevator to that. And uh, we will have seating for you on the second floor once you enter the dining room. Erin Roop, who is with McLaurin CSF, she is standing over here at the stairs. She's going to be at the entrance to the dining center, and she'll be there to assist you, at least for a while. So um, thank you for doing that, Erin. Really appreciate that. 
Now, if you have a blue ticket, it means that you are going to the Made to Flourish Pastor's Lunch, and that is actually two levels above us. So same thing, you can take the stairs of the elevator, and uh, that is going to be in the Olson boardroom. Now, if you don't have your ticket, or you lost your ticket, or you're not sure where you're supposed to go, just stop at the registration desk out here, and they will help you. And then uh, we also want to know what you thought of today's event. So I have already sent an evaluation to your email. So it's waiting in your inbox. It'll take about two minutes. It's anonymous. So we just appreciate your feedback for that. And then lastly, we want to continue this conversation with you on September 29th. Got it up here on the, sl on the slide here. Uh, Made to Flourish and Work with Purpose are both co-hosting um, a lunch at the Earl Brown Heritage Center. And uh, you have the URL in your handout. We Registration is not required, but it's helpful to us. And uh, we are hoping that you'll join us because this is an opportunity to continue this conversation, debrief on some of the things that Tom has told us today, and uh, get a chance to interact a little bit more, for, a little bit deeply uh, with your fellow pastors. So now I'm going to invite Justin up to close us out. So thanks all, all of you for being here. Appreciate it. Great. Thank you, Tessa. Well, I just want to uh, take a, a few moments at the end, first of all, just to thank each of you who gathered today. Uh, it's, a, it's a significant thing to carve out half a day to, to join in a learning exercise like this, and we, we don't take that lightly. We're thankful for you and your uh, taking time to be here. We're also very grateful for, for the partners that have joined with us in making this possible. So Thrivent Financial, we're very thankful that you're here. Uh, I've, I've taken time myself to uh, work through Brad Hewitt's book, uh, uh, new Money Mindset, it's great work. It's uh, rich with biblical thinking on how to view finances. So take some time to uh, look through that work and, uh, and I hope it influences your own way of looking at and approaching finance. Uh, we also are very grateful for McLaurin and our, our partners here at Bethel Unis University with the Church Relations. Uh, if you don't know Ralph, take some time to interact with his office. And of course, uh, Bethel is an educational institution. And uh, you know, when the time comes for you thinking about that next degree that you're interested in, we of course uh, encourage you to take a look at what uh, Bethel Seminary has to offer, as well as the broader university. I, I direct our Doctor of Ministry program. For those, so for those of you who did your uh, master's work at seminary a few years back and are looking for that next degree option, uh, certainly uh, would be happy to talk with you about some of our offerings in the Doctor of Ministry program. Uh, so thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Tom, for investing this time in our community, not only here at the Bethel community, but helping to empower the uh, the church here in the Twin Cities to think intentionally about faith, work, and economic integration. We're very grateful. I'd like to just end uh, with thanksgiving to God for this time. Let's pray. Lord, we, we are grateful. I, I'm so thankful for uh, the, the privilege we've had to interact with Tom this morning. Thank you for how you have guided him over the years in shifting his thinking uh, from a way that he described as malpractice early on to a more holistic view of your work in this world uh, from creation on through the eschatological side of the fulfillment of all things in you. Work plays a part in that and understanding the importance of our work in light of what you're doing in this world matters. So shape our thinking and allow us to take it back to our sphere of influence in the life of the church and the academy and nonprofits and the marketplace. And may we be a light for your honor and glory and for the contribution of flourishing in this world. We love you. Thank you for this time. In Christ's name, amen. Blessings on your day.